The year is December... The year is December... December 6th, 1969. The fourth quarter. The University of Texas is down 14-0 against the University of Arkansas. The President of the United States, Richard Nixon, is in the stands watching the game. And he's made it clear that the winner of this game will be declared the number one team in America, the national champion. Things aren't looking good for UT. But then on the first play of the fourth quarter, quarterback James Street scrambles for a touchdown. Under the direction of Longhorns coach Daryl Royal, Texas goes for two and they convert. The score is 14 to eight. The clock is ticking. Arkansas quarterback Bill Montgomery marches the Razorbacks 73 yards down to the Texas seven yard line. Then on third down, Montgomery throws an interception. Still down 14 to eight, Texas finds itself in a difficult situation. It's fourth down. They're on their own 43 yard line. Coach Darrell Royal decides to go for it. Texas converts with a 44 yard gain. Two plays later, Jim Bertelson scores the game-tying touchdown. Happy Feller kicks the game-winning field goal, putting Texas up 15-14. to The game ends, and Richard Nixon declares the University of Texas as a national champions. Nixon received criticism for declaring a national champion before the bowl season. But UT went on to beat Notre Dame in the Cotton Bowl Classic to remove any doubt as to who the new national champion would be. Welcome back, juniors, to another lesson in U.S. history. I hope you enjoyed that. It's a fun little story um, that I, I enjoy because it's, uh, it's about Arkansas and Texas. I'm from Arkansas, living in Texas, and I, I find those, those stories fascinating. I will point out the last time Arkansas played Texas was back in, I think, 2015, and uh, Arkansas did end up winning that game. But when it comes to national championships, it's hard to beat uh, UT, um, but we're all having fun here. Today we are going to learn about the presidency of Richard Nixon, the 37th president of the United States. We'll talk about some of the uh, things that happened in his presidency. Most of our time today will be focused on the Watergate scandal. Nixon won the office of president in 1968, and then he won it again in 1972. In fact, he won it in the largest landslide in U.S. history, defeating his opponent, George McGovern. Now, despite winning in such, this, such a huge landslide, Nixon, a Republican, was concerned about the Democrats and McGovern. And so he put a committee together to ensure that he was reelected the committee to re-elect the president, later dubbed by the media as Creep. During Nixon's presidency, he would oversee the uh, final days of uh, the Vietnam War. He would open up ties with uh, China, and he did his best to squelch any efforts by the anti-war protest movement. The Watergate scandal is going to rock the boat of America in a big way. On June 17th, 1972, five men are arrested at the Watergate Hotel for burglary. Now, the Watergate Hotel isn't just a hotel. It's also the headquarters of the Democratic National Convention. Among the items found in the possession of these five men were bugging devices, thousands of dollars in rolled up bills, and camera roll. Just a few days later, the White House denied any involvement with the break-in. It turned out that these five burglars had already wiretapped the uh, Democratic National Convention, but there, went, there was something went wrong, and so they had to go back to fix the wiretaps, and that's when they got caught. For their part in the Watergate break-in, seven men were indicted by a grand jury. Bernard Barker, Rogelio Gonzalez, E. Howard Hunt, G. Gordon Liddy, Eugenio Martinez, James McCord, and Frank Sturgis. It wasn't immediately clear that these burglars were connected to the White House, but when copies of the White House committee to re-elect the president's phone number were found on their person, police got suspicious. A couple names stand out among those who were indicted by that grand jury. G. Gordon Liddy used to work for the FBI, and James McCord was a former CIA employee. And it turns out James McCord was also the security director for the committee to re-elect the president. They were found guilty of burglary, conspiracy, and bugging the DNC headquarters and would plead guilty in their trial. In August, 
before he was reelected, Nixon gave a speech promising Americans he had nothing to do with the Watergate break-in. But it turns out Nixon wasn't telling the whole truth, when in fact he had already given orders to provide hundreds of thousands of dollars of hush money to be distributed to people to keep them quiet. Nixon even told his own aides to instruct the CIA to obstruct the FBI's investigation. Folks, that's called a abuse of power and obstruction of justice, and it's illegal. Now, the other story amidst all of this that's kind of interesting is that of Attorney General John Mitchell and his wife, Martha Mitchell. Martha Mitchell was a loudmouth Southern lady from Arkansas who went on talk shows and called into reporters to just let them know everything that was happening inside the White House. She was polarizing and exciting for reporters. But when the Watergate scandal started to unfold, Martha Mitchell started to talk. It's what she did. And what she was saying was concerning. It was not just concerning for people, but also for her husband, who worked for the president. Martha Mitchell claimed to recognize some of the men that were involved in the Watergate break-in. She then later claimed that her own husband had men kidnap her, drug her, and beat her to keep her quiet. As the story was unfolding, Martha Mitchell was declaring to anyone who would listen that her husband, John Mitchell, was this scapegoat that was being, that had all the blame placed upon him to try and protect the president. But nobody listened to her because, well, it turns out the truth was more outlandish than people were willing to accept. In fact, in the 1980s, after all of this settled down, psychologists coined the phrase, the Martha Mitchell effect. The Martha Mitchell effect is a misinterpretation of a person's justified belief as a delusion. He was telling the truth or at least some of the truth, but people didn't want to believe her, and so they thought she was delusional. In the early days of this story's unfolding, there were two reporters for the Washington Post, Bob Woodard and Carl Bernstein. They were on the case, okay, asking questions, making phone calls. They even had an anonymous inside source named Deep Throat that was giving them information that no one else had. Eventually, the investigation uh, led to Congress holding hearings, and multiple uh, Nixon aides were brought in to testify before a grand jury. One of those was a man by the name of John Dean. And in John Dean's testimony, he revealed something, well, rather shocking, that the president had been wiretapping himself. The president had been recording on tapes everything that happened in the Oval Office. This was revolutionary. It was groundbreaking to the case and to this whole series because, well, I mean, if the president is innocent, surely the tapes will exonerate him. The prosecutors knew if they could get their hands on those tapes, they would have the proof they needed to indict the president. And throughout the summer of 1973, Nixon did everything he could to keep those tapes out of the hands of Congress. Nixon and his lawyers argued that the president had something called presidential privilege, which meant that he did not have to um, abide by court orders you know, to hand over these tapes. While the Senate thought differently, and they decided that the president does not have the presidential privilege to refuse their order to hand over the tapes, and when Archibald Cox refused to stop demanding the tapes, Nixon ordered that he be fired. This led to several other justice officials resigning. These events are known as the Saturday Night Massacre. Eventually, Nixon agreed to surrender some of the tapes, but not all of them. Then in July of 1974, the Supreme Court ordered the president to turn over all of the tapes. The president offered to submit his own transcripts and edited a 1,200-page document to Congress to be reviewed. The White House eventually revealed that there was an 18-minute gap in one of the tapes. Something had been deleted. By this point, Congress has decided to push for efforts to impeach the President of the United States. And on July 31st of 1974, the tapes are released and a conversation is revealed that shows that the President knew about the cover-up. Throughout this whole time, one of the main questions that is being asked by a lot of people are, what did the President know and when did he know it? Because that matters. Because if the President 
knew that money was being passed to people to keep them quiet, then he's culpable. And when he knew that matters, because if he knew about it, you know, when the rest of America knew about it, it's no big deal. But if he knew about it before the Senate did, before the Supreme Court did, before anybody did, that makes him culpable as well. Nixon was almost certainly going to be impeached. But then on August 8th, he did something that no president had ever done before. He resigned. Six weeks later, Gerald Ford was made president of the United States, Nixon's vice president. He then promptly pardoned Richard Nixon of all crimes. The other conspirators weren't so lucky. Attorney General John Mitchell served 19 months for his role in the scandal. Gordon Liddy, former FBI agent, served four and a half years. Nixon's chief of staff, staff H.R. Uh, Haldeman, spent 19 months in prison, while John Ehrlichman spent 18 for attempting to cover up the break-in. Nixon never admitted to criminal wrongdoing, but he did acknowledge that you know, he had poor judgment. Nixon's abuse of power shook Americans' trust in the White House. The years that followed led to an atmosphere of cynicism and distrust. Many Americans were already dismayed by what was happening in Vietnam, what happened when Robert Kennedy was assassinated, and when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. The Watergate scandal just added on to an already disappointed and depressed country. They were in the middle of a financial crisis, of inflation, and an oil shortage. It was hard to believe that things could get worse, that their own president of the United States was a crook. If you're into podcasts, I highly recommend you check out the Slow Burn podcast by Leon Nafok. It is a fantastic retelling of all these events going into uh, all the, f the crazy details of what happened. Um, I'll try and remember to put a link in the description for y'all. As we get together, we're going to talk about Jimmy Carter and his presidency and the events that would define his time in office as well as the Iranian hostage crisis. But until then, thanks for watching and make it a great day.